Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the new Anbiology webinar series presented to you by the Translational Outcome Research Group of the Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta. This new series aims to celebrate the latest advances in the field of life science along with its relatedness to other disciplines. I am Bijoy and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before I begin, I would like to inform you that uh, you can post your questions in the YouTube chat box and we shall moderate them at the end of the lecture. You are free to interact with, the, each, with each other and with the speaker. If you have any questions or comments meant for the speaker or for us, feel free to email us and we shall address them to the best of our abilities. And you will also send us your feedbacks through the feedback link, which will be provided in the YouTube chat box uh, near the end of the session. Our convener, Professor NRI Energy of Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta, conveyed her good wishes to the speaker. So I would like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome our speaker, today's speaker, Dr. Shaurapal. Uh, very warm Thank welcome you. to you, sir. Thank you so, very much. Thank you, Vijay. So before, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so before I hand over to sir, I would like to give a brief introduction of today's speaker. Today, we have uh, Dr. Shaurabh Pal with us as our speaker. Uh, Dr. Pal obtained his uh, PhD from University of Otago, New Zealand back in 2014 in Institute Ecology. Uh, he did his postdoctoral study at uh, Nelson Mandel University, uh, South Africa in 2014. He received his uh, second postdoctoral um, from uh, in, uh, Universidad de la Republica in uh, Uruguay back in 2016. He taught in University of Otago, uh, Diamond Harbor Women's University. Currently, he's working as a DST inspired faculty in Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta. His primary research interests are estuarian and uh, coasts, plankton, and fisheries management. Uh, Dr. Pal has many research uh, publications in journals uh, to his credit. Uh, he is recipient of the Best Young Scientist Award uh, 2017 from Zoological uh, Society, Kolkata. And uh, he also received the DST Inspire Faculty Award in 2016. We are glad to host him today and excited to, excited to hear from him. Uh, sir, this stage is also yours. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you for your illustrious in, uh, information about my career. I would rather say that I always uh, being uh, I always try to stay as as an estuary enthusiast. I I started my uh, enthusiasm on estuaries when I was really a kid. Um, my parents used to take me uh, to Indian Sundarbans, and uh, from there I literally fell in love with estuaries, and and uh, that I took it as one of, uh, as my career, <clears throat> uh, and that's how the passion became a career for me, and um, I'm blessed with uh, working with different colleagues. Uh, from different continents and different countries as well as in our country. So I uh, I would rather uh, acknowledge them before my talk that without their help uh, that, that is not possible, uh, this talk is not possible. I would also like to uh, thank Professor NRI Banerjee for hosting this talk on histories and and my and my seminar thank you so much uh, if if things are all then uh, bijoy shall i share the slides is that okay hello yes sir we can share the, uh, we can see the slides i uh, can you go with slide show mode yeah so shall i start that's fine Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, it's fine. We can see. Okay. You should start. Thank you, everyone. Many of you uh, actually know me personally, have interacted with me. I have interacted with you guys, too. And some of you uh, have uh, are seeing me for the very first time. Anyway, my name is Saurav, and I'm a TST Inspire faculty at the Department of Zoology at University of Calcutta. By training, I'm an ecologist uh, who practice ecology in estuaries. And my lab, that is Coastal and Quantitative Ecology Research Laboratory, currently focusing on many aspects of plankton ecology and fish ecology and ecological economics. But um, 
Today, uh, we are going to talk about uh, dogmas, the estrine dogmas, and we will uh, see how uh, we will provide perspectives on those dogmas based on our research experiences in Kenji's. But before I talk, uh, start the talk, I must uh, <clears throat> thank the University of Calcutta for hosting me as a DST Inspire faculty for these years and the Department of Science and Technology, which provided the funding for my research and all sort of activities that are linked with DST Inspire faculty award. So <clears throat> some of you may know what is an history. Some of you don't know because you haven't seen one. Anyway, to simplify the, uh, the definition of an estuary, uh, many of us quite e uh, easily say that um, an estuary is basically where river meets the sea. And some of us who have uh, grown up in, uh, in this part of the world have seen Indian Sundarban. And here you can see an estuary piercing through the heart of Sundarban and then mangrove landscape. So there one, there's, there's, the, there's the sea and uh, then you find the, uh, the mangroves all over and the history is going to meandering through it. Now, this is not always a true shape of an history. If some of you go to Kerala uh, in the southern India, you might have visited uh, the uh, backwaters. You may not recognize them as estuaries, but they are estuaries. They are very saline estuaries. And the, this is one of the picture. Then I kind of grew up a little bit in New Zealand while doing my PhD. And I worked on small estuaries, uh, which sometimes open and sometimes close. Here you can see the many of them and uh, in different phases of their, their cycle. These are called intermittently open close estuaries. Then some of you may know the largest fresh uh, saltwater lake of Asia, which is Shilka. It's a lagoon. It's also an estuary. Look at that. Kind of surprising, isn't it? That how different these estuaries are coming in terms of their shapes and sizes and the forms. You can notice over here that the sea mouth has shifted a little bit over the years. So the estuaries actually change over space and time. You can take down that the estuaries are very extreme ecosystems, very dynamic ecosystems that change with space and time. Now, if space and time both are changing, then how you set a definition for an, for an ecosystem or, or you set a definition of an entity? So that's why in 2019, I wrote a paper along with my team where I kind of note, I kind of hesitantly noted down because I'm still an, an early career econ, uh, academic uh, that has to feel a lot of peer pressure. But anyway, we kind of wrote down that the estuary is just an, uh, a kind of an ecotone, means like uh, it's a juncture of two ecosystems. But in a true sense, an estuary doesn't have a definition because uh, the variability is too extreme. And as mankind has never uh, explored all of these variabilities, so we cannot set a simplified definition of an estuary right at this moment. But then what is a dogma? When you, uh, a dogma is it's kind of popular belief or, or religion, like, well, I said this and this is what it is. But this is not how the science should go. Many of you practice science either in undergraduate level to the very top. And uh, you have to understand or you already uh, much uh, mature for me to understand that these uh, the science goes through uh, experimentation, science goes through challenge, science goes through uh, testing hypotheses. But for young academics or young early career scientists like me, it needs a lot of courage to uh, challenge the conventional ideas or the ideas that have uh, poured to you or uh, over the years through different, uh, through different medium of science. One of those uh, legends or one of those um, 
<clears throat> I would say the uh, dogma in estuarine ecology is plankton are indicators of ecological stress of estuaries irrespective of space and time and ecological state. When I say ecological state, I basically mean that whether it, is, it doesn't matter whether the estuary is stable or perturbed, you still find copy boards or the plankton, they are doing their jobs as, as ecological indicators. So they kind of have a superhero sort of image, isn't it? <clears throat> now, what are plankton? If you are not from biology, you may take them as very small organism that drift in water, carried along by tides and currents. And copy, what are copy pods then? The copy pods are sort of a plankton. They, they are kind of a plankton. Uh, and surprisingly, they are the world's most abundant metazoan. That means they are literally everywhere. Okay. Wherever there is water, you find them. Uh, they could be free living, they could be parasitic. The parasitic ones are much larger than the free living ones. But overall, mostly they are microscopic. And when you zoom into them, they, these are the pictures that you see <coughs> of copy pods. But the copy pods are indicators of ecological stress of estuaries. This is an idea that that is built over the decades because you find research coming out of uh, very high impact journals that are saying these are ideal candidates for uh, studying ch uh, changing environment they are good indicators uh, core research components and so on with a, so a lot of studies have been devoted to them in terms of long term long term especially in the rich countries like the north no, countries of northern america and uh, europe you find them people studying them for three to five that they decades and seeing how the changes are related changes of community and populations are related to the uh, oceanographic conditions <clears throat> they the copy pods are considered ecological indicators not from now it's if you look at, open up this paper from e ecology uh, it's quite old now and it says copy pod indicator species in estuaries so and then you find also sort of rec uh, the recent papers that have uh, provided perspectives on climate change and how that's going to affect the lower trophic levels of marine food wave and there you also see the copy pods and and their change of their size and abundance are being seen as indicators of change of hydrographic conditions <laughs> now based on huge literature that, uh, that has been accumulated uh, in estuarine science for over 70 years over 100 years time scale uh, it's kind of notion that has built that these tiny organisms do their job irrespective of time uh, irrespective of uh, space they are indicating the hydro like hydrological condition or the oceanographic conditions of mar coastal marine environment so i i grew up with that idea and i um i was in only in my first postdoc when i kind of stumbled uh with this idea but before that i was embracing it with two hands um uh, you because I, I also got papers which looked at the like uh, pollution aspects of estuaries and uh, they, they say that the copy ports do their job and, and the copy ports uh, will indicate the marine pollutions or the coastal pollutions. But in 2016, I wrote one of my paper along with two of the, guru, the, the copy port gurus uh, <clears throat> with Prof. Ulrich and Prof. Peris Noto from South Africa. At that time, I was working in the temperate estuaries of South Africa. And we had a sizable data set. It had monthly resolution. And the results were kind of eye-opening to us. We could see that, uh, especially I could see that the most uh, abundant copy board, that is uh, Acacia longipetala, is not the best predictor of the salinity and temperature fluctuation of the estuary. However, as I say, confessed before, 
I was still an early career academic and I had uh, a lot of peer pressure on me uh, to go beyond the dogmas. So kind of in the end of this paper, I wrote up this, I wrote this suggestion that saying, okay, uh, a suggestion is to use the, the specific taxonomic groups such as copy pods to better understand the abiotic stress factors of specific set of estuaries where the freshwater of the reach are stirred until a one size fits all indicator is found for temperate estuaries. So I kind of took one step or two step forward and one step back because there were there are still a lot of dilemma in me whether I should challenge this dogma or not. And here I believe a lot of uh, some of the students are participating in the seminar. Uh, many of you uh, have heard this term called ecological indicator. What does it actually mean? It means a taxon, maybe a community, maybe a species uh, that communicate information of an ecosystem stress, natural or human induced in simple terms. Uh, that can be understood and used to make management decisions. So this is not a term that is coming from science. This is basically a term that is coming for, from management and for managers. It is a simple way to communicate your, your study results. But remember the, always remember the wise man, the Einstein. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So <clears throat> that was the idea for me and that was the challenge for me too and I took up that challenge and uh, I try, started avoiding the dogma. So with this hypothesis that ecologically dominant copy pods hardly indicate estuarine stress because they are less affected by variability irrespective of time scales that we are talking about. I think this is kind of a bit exaggerated because it's not the irrespective of time. I would rather say if, if we at that time I was working in South America <clears throat> and I was working uh, on a data set gathered from an extremely large estuary um, in, in that splits Uruguay and Argentina, that splits literally between Uruguay and Argentina. Um, and I was working with a team uh, that includes Danilo Cagliari as one of the leading copy pod biologists of the world. <clears throat> he he, kind, he uh, kind of gathered a data set uh, which had a nested sampling design. That means he sampled a uh, few weeks, few months and then few season for uh, of a year. Uh, he had to overcome a lot of like uh, resource challenges, but there was a data set which was very interesting and we wanted to see if, if we apply this um, <clears throat> time scale, different time scales, uh, whether we could see any sort of uh, effects of environment on copy pods, be it their assemblages, be it their dominant populations like the Acacia tonsa or Paracalanus parvus. Uh, to our surprise, we literally didn't find that much. And we wrote up something like that. Overall, the results suggest that the most prevalent mesozooplankton of Rio de la Plata estuary are possibly resilient to environmental fluctuations. So there the first step, there was the first step for me. Uh, that I avoided the dogma. Now, with the, then I shifted uh, to India to start up my lab, but I meant uh, at that time, at that juncture, uh, Danilo and I again wrote up a paper that provided perspectives on scales of sampling. So the idea that we were playing at that time where uh, if you add if you have multiple scales, temporal scales for a sampling, say starting from week to by week to uh, to month to season, then if you if you add one more or if you lose one lose one uh, from your sampling, 
whether that does it matter whether there is matter uh, you are losing some ecological information or not that means we have very common uh, notions that the more we sample the more better we understand our ecosystems but does it actually apply uh, well to our uh, surprise that the uh, it kind of does not if you, if you uh, think of short to medium term data sets so we uh, ended up giving this uh, recommendation uh, i should read out uh, considering the institutional resource limitations uh, because that is quite true for south america and uh, many of the developing countries including india and the present hypothesis under consideration the authors suggest that the short term high resolution sampling may provide useful complementary information to interpret results of longer term natural changes occurring in estuaries so well if you have small the short term data set medium term data sets you're not going to talk about climate change you're not going to talk about el ninos but you may uh, these results are gold when you uh, want to explain the smaller scales variabilities of those uh, long term results so the, that was kind of an eye opener for me and when then i start at that time i already started my lab uh, back in india and uh, we were uh, playing with this uh, different ideas of what to do and wh where to start from and we started with this hypothesis that basically says environmental gradients of estuaries change with time and are exaggerated by seasonal extremes which have cascading implications for communities such as the coffee pot community which act as a benthic pelagic couple uh, our aim was to find the coffee pot based indicator of abiotic stress by saying abiotic stress we were concentrating mostly on uh, salinity change, temperature change, pH change of an estuary, uh, of a tropical river estuary, taking Ganges as, a, as our example. Now, this is a picture that uh, shows the food wave of an estuary. It is, uh, you, you can see the plankton, uh, you can see fish and uh, snakes and, and birds and they are linked to each other. Especially if you look at the uh, zoom into plankton, they are small organism, kind of float in the water. Uh, sometimes they, they go down to the bottom, they sit there. So based on where they are in the water column, you can classify them as epibenthos, hyperbenthos, and the, and the, uh, the ones that, are, that they float in the water column. Uh, the coffee pods are ideal candidates because they are made the most of the zooplankton communities of tropical estuaries are consist of the, the, the coffee pods. So we started working with them. We started doing sampling. Uh, this is Ganges and you could see we have a very tiny boat uh, overcoming many other resource limitations. Uh, we started our sampling we started our we we concentrated mostly in the muriganga section of the ganges river here you see the map and we have three sites we here in the video we had already arrived in one of the slides um, they, uh, these sites are that they basically close to namkhana region of west bengal and this Muri, uh, the purpose of choosing muriganga was this is a section of the Ganges River estuary which gets a lot of uh, gradients of salt uh, coming from the Bay of Bengal and it also receives significant with the volume of fresh water coming down from the, 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 down uh, through the through the estuary, uh, river. We had less number of people to work with us so we had to train even the uh, the boatmen to do the scientific work uh, that was, uh, and we train the uh, school kids coming uh, over their summer vacation and, and helping us in our study. And we even did not spare these policemen. We made the full use of them as, uh, as bench 
and and wrote down our data uh, in the in the cold the, the cold winter days. So although there were many resource limitations, we tried to overcome them through various means, and we collected uh, we collected started collecting data on a monthly basis. Uh, so applying monthly or seasonal scale. In this part of the uh, India, you will find three seasons, pre-monsoon, monsoon and post-monsoon. And you can already see in this table that there are uh, the gradients of salinity, temperature and pH. You can see the temperature goes down really uh, low uh, in the post-monsoon, that is the winter time. And the salinity is the salinity is very low in the monsoon because there are a lot of rain. <clears throat> so not only we were collecting uh, the environmental variables, we were also collecting uh, copy pot assemblages, and uh, we are uh, identifying them to the very species level. Uh, you can see over here there are uh, different copy pots being collected in different seasons and uh, representing different numbers. Uh, these copy pots also belong to different food habits. Some of them are omnivores, some of them are carnivores, some of them are herbivores. And they are different, they are, come, they are from different body size. If they are uh, less than one millimeter, which they are mostly, most of them are, they are uh, small size. So you can easily conclude from this table that uh, most of the Gangetic copy pods are uh, small in size. Some of them are medium, basically 1 to 1.5 millimeter. And some of them are uh, really large copy pods that is uh, beyond 1.5 millimeter. But they are very few. Trust me, they are very few. We explored whether these copy pods uh, assemblages are different in terms of space and in terms of time consistent to the hypothesis that we were talking about uh, in terms of space uh, we kind of see that the s2 and the s3 uh, two of the sides are, are just very close to each other and the, 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 and uh, it is not at all separated whereas s1 which is uh, towards the upstream end of the estuary towards the head of the estuary or means it gets more fresh water than the s3 uh, it is a bit separated, but in terms of statistical sense, not much of a difference is going on here. If you think of the uh, seasonal variability, you can see that the post-monsoon copy pod assemblage is, is standing apart from the ones in of monsoon and pre-monsoon. That means if you go to sampling in Ganges, uh, in the post monsoon, you will likely to have a different set of uh, maybe your assemblage, your collection may look quite different than what you uh, if you collect them in monsoon and pre monsoon. So we ex then ventured into the population level. We started to see whether these uh, populations of these component populations of the coffee pot community, uh, whether they respond to different abiotic gradients or not. Uh, to our surprise, most of them were not responding to it. Uh, you can say that most of them are well adapted or well adjusted to the, the gradients of salinity, temperature and pH. So <clears throat> through this study, we had this sort of conclusion that the abiotic environment of Muriganga stretch of this estuary of the Ganges estuary may vary with monthly or seasonal scale, but such abiotic variability has lesser impact on the copy pot community as a whole or even its populations. That shows the resilience and less suitability of copy pots as stress indicators of estuaries if you consider monthly or seasonal scale studies. So after applying this monthly or seasonal scale, we would love to have one with a daily scale. 
unfortunately our study sites were far from the university and we don't have enough uh, funding to go uh, the, the down there every day or uh, very often so we didn't have the uh, the daily scale studies we skipped the daily scale we uh, ended up with hourly scale uh, now this any study of hourly scales is extremely rare for histories be it copy pods or be it of any aquatic organisms so here uh, again we started sampling a lot of uh, on hourly scales and we were sampling like 12 hours continuously to see how they are ch ch how the the environment and the community is going to change or whether they change at all in a semi diurnal basis uh, here you can see that the the salinity temperature ph do uh, dissolved oxygen and nitrate we were logging them there are uh, quite a few changes that we have noticed over this uh, sampling hours but most of them change are not so exaggerated most of them are basically chronic we yes we were also collecting uh, copy pot assemblages over the period of the uh, time every hour and you can see here also that some of these guys like Bestiolina similis, Paracalinus parvus, Acartia totniformis, Acartia spinicorda, all these guys were making really big towers uh, of their numbers. Whereas there are guys like Eucalinus elongatus, Eucatamarina, uh, Acrocalinus jiber, and these are species which were hardly represented because they were. Uh, even absent in specific time of the, the of the day and we're having very less number of individuals so when you sample continuously for on a on an hourly scale you could see a lot of variability is going on not only in environment but also in the uh, copy pot assemblages in terms of uh, their abundance now the question that may pop up with when you change the time does the first boy of the class stays as the first boy of the class or does it or it loses its or he loses his position to the second or the third boy or to some other to do to test that we uh, did some uh, rank abundance curve based on different uh, the si different sites that we have collected the data from I know this graph is difficult to, um, to look at, uh, but basically, if you look very close, the Paracalinus parvus, uh, Bestiolina similis, and Acatia totniformis uh, are the Acatia totniformis are the three main uh, copy pods that are uh, coming up as first, second, and third guys of this batch. And even in a space of few hundred meters, you could see that their ranks are changing. That means it, uh, your study sites may be very close, but in a, uh, in a variable environment of an estuary, uh, even in those close sites, you may have separate community structure or separate dominance. But anyway, uh, we could not we then uh, try to correlate some of these changes with the environmental variables i am not going to do uh, to present all of those results but uh, a paper came uh, that came out and that basically says uh, sorry it should be 2019 instead of 2021 uh, that basically says the environment of Moriganga estuary is variable in hourly scale yes it is variable but such variability is often chronic uh, as you have already seen that it's not the variability is not exaggerated uh, that may that sort of chronic variability may affect the diversity density and dominance of copy ports uh, already you have seen it through the results 
but it doesn't uh, but that doesn't mean that overall the community is uh, the crumbling or the community is changing its uh, own course so it is the community is overall um, resilient and therefore is less suitable as stress indicator when hourly scale is in consideration now that we again started uh, playing up with it with an idea that if we apply this hourly scale of study in different season uh, of a year what will happen you can see this first graph over here it is a kind of early pre monsoon in india you see this these are the, the, the heart of the monsoon time and this is the heart of the pre, uh, post monsoon time yeah, we were plotting this uh, we did the similar studies in once uh, in every season and we sta we started seeing the variability of salinity temperature and ph uh, in a space of hourly scales in different season the seasonal patterns you can uh, you can see the seasonal patterns especially in terms of temperature you can see that the, uh, you can see seasonal patterns in terms of uh, salinity which is quite depressed in the monsoon time and uh, pH level in the post monsoon is kind of elevated than uh, the ones in the pre monsoon and the monsoon time. So although we were sampling on hourly basis, we were still gathering signals of, uh, of the seasons, like seasonal contrasts. We, we started to see the biology and here you could see in the first one, uh, and this is the, the figure three represent the first set of samples ca coming from pre monsoon figure four is coming from monsoon and figure five is coming from post monsoon. One thing that is quite common in the first row is that if you go towards night, like H1 being the day, we used to start our sampling generally at one o'clock in, uh, in the afternoon and used to carry on till 12 o'clock at, at night. So the nighttime species richness is quite enhanced and that is uh, literally capturing the basics of copepod biology because many of the copepods uh, come up in the surface only at the night time and they, they go down to the bottom in the, uh, in the daylight or in the, in the, during the day. If you, if you ask me whether this daytime and nighttime communities are separate, well, for the, uh, for the monsoon and the, the, and the post monsoon, they are literally not. But you can see the distinct clusters or the assemblages uh, when it comes to pre-monsoon time. The question that comes up whether there is any variability in terms of their size. One thing that is quite uh, interesting to see, if you go to the post-monsoon time, you hardly find large, the large copy boards. The large copy boards are mostly in the in the uh, pre-monsoon and monsoon time and if you think of the uh, their feeding habits then you find that when you go to the daytime uh, of the, the daytime especially in the post monsoon you hardly find carnivores but if you compare the daytime of uh, pre-monsoon and monsoon, you see there are copy ports present here. Here these reds are copy ports uh, that, uh, that are carnivore and the green ones are herbivore and the uh, blue ones are basically omnivores. So and then you can uh, break down these results to see the average similarity and dissimilarity uh, and which are the species that are responsible for them. 
where the <clears throat> and you can see that there are these three guys like Bestil in a similes, Paracalena Sparvus and Ecartia Tortoniformis, they're literally everywhere and they are driving a lot of the similarity. And then there are a lot of the other species which are driving the dissimilarity of the assemblages that are being collect, collected from different seasons <clears throat> on hourly scale. Now, the, what, you, what these results basically tells us? These results basically tell, suggest that variability exists. They exist in the seasonal form, but it could be traced through an hourly scale, if, if not higher scale. That means it would be better if we can sample even per minute. Um, but that is not what our resources permit. So, so far what we were discussing, uh, we were discussing things when estuaries are stable. We now, from now onwards, we are going to discuss when estuaries are actually part of or unstable. One of the things that make them really unstable is this cyclone. And if you are living in India, you could really correlate that in the recent years, the cyclone intensity is increasing. Here, there are a lot of cyclone paths that are crisscrossing the uh, Indian Sundarban and all over India. In terms of the uh, effect, well, we are sitting only in the third in the world. Okay. Uh, if we think of the first, the last 50 years, the number of people are being affected. So I was thinking how uh, cyclones are going to affect the estuaries and especially the ecological communities of estuaries. Considering if you think of the cyclone frequency of Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, one thing you can see that the in the last decade, the severe cyclonic storms have actually increased quite a lot here in the last decade, but the cyclonic storms have actually decreased. That means we may have cyclones that are really intense. Uh, we are experiencing more of them and we are experiencing less number of them if they are just ordinary cyclone or, or a depression. Now, some of you literally don't, uh, uh, maybe just inquisitive, like when the cyclones hit uh, India, the cyclones hit, hit India mostly in the late pre-monsoon, that is in May, April, May, and in the early, uh, the post-monsoon, uh, that is like, like October, November, and in the monsoon, you really don't uh, find a lot, a lot of them, maybe a lot of depression, but not the severe cycl the cyclonic storms that are increasing in the, uh, in this decade. What we did as a lab, we started a wing called cyclone ecology. And we started chasing uh, cyclones uh, for last two years, starting from Cyclone Feni to Bulbul to Amphan to Yas. These are the dates that they have passed these study sites of ours. And this is their landfall site. Two of them actually made their landfall quite close to our study sites. Their probable sp their speeds uh, when they pass this section of the estuary, and when we started sampling, and how long we sample, and at what interval, and you could see that the day they pass, and the day we started sample is not that far. Is not really that far. Uh, it takes, uh, I must thank all my team members to show up extreme courage to do that because it involves a lot of risk to sample estuaries 
uh, that are being ravaged by the cyclones and extremely severe cyclonic storms like Amphan uh, or Yash. We had this um, hypothesis in consideration that basically says abiotic gradients of estuaries are temporarily exaggerated by cyclone mediated changes which may stress the copy pot community. And uh, not only we worked, we also published uh, our uh, work in different journals. Uh, we kind of stated in these sort of words, we stated that the intensity of cyclone is increasing in Indian Sundarban. Therefore, uh, following a cyclone, uh, more severe or prolonged disruptions may be possible or at times there, the cyclones are not that intense and you may find the disruptions are just temporary. But anyway, we need institutionalized monitoring uh, of our estuaries. Uh, otherwise, these cyclone mediated changes are difficult to uh, break down and to, uh, to analyze. I would show you results of two of the cyclones that we have already chased. We are working on the couple of others, but uh, in this seminar, we would concentrate most on uh, Cyclone Feni and Cyclone Bulbul. And you could see that uh, we were sampling uh, at a stretch of seven days. Every day we were sampling and we started sampling three days after the cyclone. So seventh day here essentially means like the 10th day, the cyclone has passed through the Ganges. Uh, uh, not much things are going on over here. Ex uh, you can see that the salinity is not, it's literally flat. It, it is not changing too much. Uh, but the pH levels have actually gone down after cyclone Feni. Okay. You could see that uh, not much things were going on in, in, uh, in terms of temperature, temperature and salinity and pH, uh, when cyclone Bulbul hit the the, the Muriganga stretch of the Ganges River, that basically what happens. If you if you look at if you break down the scale, if you break down the scale to the minute, the changes are become very chronic. You don't see boom and bust. But if you go in sampling one day, the once in one month or once in two or three months you may find really drastic changes. Now, these sort of changes of environment are basically chronic in, in, even after it is happening a cyclone. We were collecting uh, also the biological data and here one of the, the few of the interesting thing that I want to share with all of you is that the first column belongs to a guy called Bestiolina similis. See, even after Cyclone Feni or Cyclone Bulbul, this guy stays on the top. So it, no matter what happens to uh, the system, this guy is kind of a king. Uh, it literally don't care of the city, what's going on on its surrounding. And it's a small size copy pot. It's an omnivore. Followed by some of these other guys like Paracalanus parvus, Acatia tautoniformis, and something, and Acatia spinicorda. Uh, <clears throat> two of them are omnivores, one of them is herbivore. Uh, one of the interesting things you come down here, you find a bunch of these guys called Timura tabinata, Pseudodiaptomus bingami, uh, Labidocera euceta, Paracalanus indicus. These guys were present only after Cyclone Feni. They were not present uh, after Cyclone Bulbul. And if you look at these guys and the very bottom in, in this uh, kind of color, uh, Acrocalanus gracilis, Oncia venista, Acrocalanus monachus, Utapina equitiforms, you find them, the, them we found them only after Bulbul, we didn't find them after Feni. And when you consider their feeding habits, the corresponding feeding habits and the corresponding size. That means you can already make up a story. That means inside a community, you are already seeing species being rearranged 
like the uh, their size class is rearranged and the feeding guilds of the community are being rearranged so many things are changing in the community uh, they may be subtle but and they may need a daily scale to study but many things are changing in the backdrop if you plot the diversity indices you see that by the first day they were really down in in all locations and they're creeping back and by the seventh day they have literally gained the momentum and if you look at the, the papers, open up the papers and read the details of it, you will find these are the results that have been explained in details there. That despite, I would read out for you, despite variable intensity of Cyclone Feni and Bulbul, with which they hit the study, same study sites, species richness was 16 by the seventh day of sampling. It is quite a coincident that uh, two cyclones with of two different intensity, uh, but they eventually, by the 10th day uh, of the cyclone, that means the seventh day of the sampling, both had the, uh, the species richness stands the same, but the expectation may be different. Uh, irrespective of abiotic variability, within 10 days of each cyclone hit the study sites, species richness recovered more than 50 percent to the condition prevailed before the cyclone uh, generally you if you go to the sampling in the ganges and a normal day you may find like if you sample hard enough you may find uh, like about i would say 28 to 30 species uh, con considering you are using 200 micron net if you are using uh, less the, like a uh, higher microns means like 50 micron or 100 micron nets you may find more but uh, but we work with 200 micron nets and uh, that is the standard that we follow and all the results that i am showing you are the results of 200 micron nets <clears throat> the species composition changed as you have already witnessed after each cyclone, but the dominance of bestial in a similis did not change, right? So, tracing these changes or the constants of the copypot community demands high resolution sampling for a better estimate of cyclone mediated disruptions of the copypot community. So, if we hadn't sampled per day, if we, uh, we may not had uh, this idea how quickly a community bounce back or, or recover, what are the components of the community that literally remains unaffected. So in a sense, I would rather say that even after being hit by cyclones, uh, the copypot community is quite resilient and, and it can uh, withstand the stochastic changes. So in conclusion, uh, of this entire seminar, I would say, I would again bring up this estuarine dogma that basically says the copy pods are indicators of abiotic stresses of estuaries. But these sort of dogma actually arise and have come, uh, has come up because of the decadal studies that are being conducted in few developed nations of North America and Europe. As uh, you go to uh, United States, Canada, you go to Norway, you go to England, you'll find studies that are uh, running for six decades, five decades, four decades. So those are absolutely classic long term studies. But if you then see a whole lot of literature are actually focusing on monthly or seasonal scale for a few months to a few years. The copypot community uh, and its dominant populations mostly remain unaffected in face of monthly and seasonal and hourly abiotic variability when Ganges estuary remains stable. That, were, that is coming from our results. Uh, even after successive cyclones, the copypot community had bounced back to its routine within a few days to a few weeks. Therefore, 
less affected by the stochastic changes of the estuary. So, in, in, in a sense, we can conclude that the uh, estuarine coffee cores that we have studied in this part of the Ganges are highly flexible and are possibly less useful as indicators of abiotic stresses of estuaries if a medium to short temporal scale is in consideration. Uh, I, I said most of my studies are medium to short term because uh, I'm studying the, uh, here uh, the copy ports for last three years or so. So if I, if I would get an opportunity to study them for 12 years or more, I could see or 10 years or more, then I could say it's a relatively long term study. But anyway, this small, the, the small scale uh, studies have actually contradicted the dogma. The dogma basically says that uh, copy pods indicate estuarine stress or the abiotic stress uh, irrespective of scales. The scales fall apart when you, when you uh, zoom in, when you consider that the lesser, like a smaller and smaller versions or the higher or higher resolutions, however you want to say this. Developing nations yet hardly have resources for long-term studies of estuarine copy pods, which is a reality in India. You don't find a single long-term study of uh, the copy pods uh, being developed in India. So the estuarine dogma that lives in the northern North America and Europe remain kind of unchallenged in India and uh, many other developing nations. Now, here, as uh, young people or young academics or many students who are watching this, we have to understand what we have and what we need and where we want to go. <clears throat> so what we have is sometimes could be depressing because, for example, from the, study, the insights that I gained from all these studies that I am uh, showing it to you, I wrote up a proposal and only to hear back from the uh, reviewer that this proposal of continuous monitoring has not enough scientific merit or it is too ambitious. But I would rather say if, if we are not ambitious, then how we challenge the dogmas? We have to challenge the dogmas, we have to be really ambitious, we have to be really skeptic, and we have to practice rigorous science. So, development of a copy board based indicator of ecological stress of Indian estuaries need monitoring of baselines, which right now we lack, and we also lack the baselines for uh, stochastic changes. We have to do it for long term. We don't, uh, we have funding, we have resources for short term studies, we need nurturing of long term studies. And in this case, the Ganges history could be uh, a, uh, an ideal case, a, a model. Uh, if, if, if Ganges happens to serve as a model, then it needs permanent sampling locations spread across its marine and freshwater dominated sections. At present, we uh, as a lab has really challenged by resources. So we are constrained in a small space, but we would rather like to have and the, uh, have samples from coming from different stretches of Ganges for uh, or any other who may conceive a study, long term study needs to take these things in consideration. Sampling shall include catchments that are less impacted. Uh, if you go towards the Sundarban region, you may find some less impacted uh, sites. If you come up the uh, urban sites uh, and the cities like Calcutta, you find a lot of the uh, catchments are being like highly impacted, but we need samples from both, both, uh, from both places. And the public as well as private postal organizations of this region shall play a proactive role in installing infrastructure uh, and engaging trained manpower. I would, uh, a lot of time we leave everything to the government. I would say here, uh, public-private partnership, private 
uh, as well as the public, all we have the responsibility uh, to install long-term infrastructures from where ecological studies could be conducted. We have ma trained manpower, but we may not have them in one place. So engaging the trained manpower not only would open up jobs for a lot of the young people that are taking the degrees, but it will also enable us to do a lot of better science. And we do need sustained support. We don't need sporadic support. We do need consistent support uh, from our state and central institutions, uh, different funding agencies uh, who could have the vision to uh, invest in long-term studies and long-term infrastructure uh, through which we can really challenge dogmas. Uh, in this case, this is uh, a shrine dogma, but there, there could be different dogmas in different biological domains. Uh, that's what I all I want to say. I want to thank my team members who in the different generations have uh, contributed to the, uh, to the lab, to the field, to do the administration, to do the microscopy. Good. Uh, I am really thankful to them. Without their cooperation, this seminar is literally not possible. And to whenever I sit back and uh, think of my research journey, the one thing that comes up in my mind is impermanence is the only truth so we should keep on going and challenge the dogmas that are haunting us uh, for a better science for a better tomorrow thank you all thank you so much for listening to me uh, <clears throat> thank you so much thank you sir uh, for the wonderful and enriching lecture uh, so we have a few questions from our audience. Uh, with your permission, can you go through them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first question is from uh, Yanashivan Kishn. Uh, he's asking uh, that uh, this piece is a resilient uh, but may not uh, the test bioindicator, but uh, perhaps they may be a good candidate for testing biomarkers within the uh, physiology, uh, like DNA damage. So that's his question. Uh, hello, Yanis. I hope you are doing uh, doing good. Uh, uh, thanks, mate. It's it's uh, it's a really engaging question. Uh, I would say yes. We need to take up this uh, plankton science to the molecular level. Most of the science done on plankton are still on the organism level. So we not we are not able to find bioindicators through the dominant copy pods or through the dominant taxa taxon but uh, if you look at their physiology at the molecular level you may find the chronic changes that are accumulating in response to different environmental changes uh, that would be the next level of studies uh, the, the developing that, that's already initiated in developed countries but we as developing nations don't have the resources to take out them take them up but this is Definitely an approach that could be thought of and that could be uh, applied to test whether this dogma lives on or not. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you for answering. Uh, so the next question is from Tanmay Nandi. Uh, he's asking, are the student copepods uh, considered as most ecologically flexible organisms? Well, th thank you, Tanmay, for your, uh, for your question. On my, uh, I would say that uh, I give a personalized answer rather to it, okay? Because uh, I have lived with copy ports only for ten years now. In this ten years, I I, I have uh, tackled organisms other than copy ports like mice. I have um, in 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 the small scale uh, that I have studied, I have seen that these organisms are really flexible because uh, if you think of their community, if you think of their uh, populations, uh, especially the ones that live in estuaries, uh, there is a zone in estuary that called a subsidized zone. That means basically 
where you get a lot of variability, but that variability acts as a favor for certain group of organisms uh, that makes them very flexible to uh, resist that variability. So they are super adapted. Uh, copy pods, in most cases, if they are resident copy pods of an estuary, they are often urihaline and they can tolerate uh, whatever literally you throw, throw at them. You, uh, if you go sampling in Ganges, uh, you will find, find the copy pods. Uh, they are living next to the pollutant sites, next to uh, pristine sites, next to semi-impacted sites. Uh, for example, uh, one of these copy pods I, I see here is Akartia tonsa. Now, I have seen this copy pod. I have worked with this copy pod in New Zealand estuaries, which are pristine. I have worked with them in the South Africa. I have worked with them in, in, in Uruguay. And I am working with them um, in, in India. So you can see there is a lot of gradient in terms of environment. They are overcoming that, in, that, that uh, gradient. You can see these estuaries are completely different in terms of characters, but they are still living there. And you can also imagine that New Zealand, uh, Uruguay and South Africa and India, they do have different degrees of uh, modification of their estuaries. And these guys are still living there. That means they are kind of super adapted. So whether they are the most ecologically flexible organism, I am not uh in a position to say whether they are the most but they are not definitely the least i can say that uh, very clearly thank you so the next question is from orpo patrol uh, he is asking some of the copy uh, disappeared after fanny and some of them after bulbul why is that and what's the possible reason behind this phenomenon and is there any significance behind this well uh I would not say disappear. Yeah, disappear means uh, yeah they were not there. Definitely they were not there because every day we were sampling, and uh, you could see that some of these species were uh, uh, not there after the cyclone, but they are there after the, after another cyclone. The thing that happens generally happen after a cyclone is the mechanical disruption. Uh, I, I would say many of these copy pods which are uh, which are occasional intruders. Uh, if you if you look at these uh, later, if you look at those uh, lists of copy pods that are present only after Fenny and or only after uh, bulbul some of them are actually intruders not the uh, typical estuarine residents they are uh, they come over in uh, come into the community and for a certain period of time either by backslash of a of a uh, <clears throat> after a cyclone or something like that in an estuary or being washed out from the top of the estuary by the, by some flood. So these sort of uh, the rearrangements are not uh, unthinkable. I would not say they are very common, but they can happen. That can happen. Uh, I would attribute the physical uh, the mechanical forcing for some such phenomena such phenomena rather than abrupt changes of environment because you have already i have already answered previously to this question that how these copy ports can adapt to different cause like uh, oceans in the world so i would be belittling them if i say that if a, that a copy port just simply die uh, because the salinity change one to two uh, gradient or a temperature change one to two gradient it is rather the mechanical forcing uh, that destroys their colony for some time or just like wash them out something like that uh, i would say it is quite significant significant in a sense 
uh, if you think of a food wave, that uh, when you think of a food wave, you always think of few things, few dimensions. Like one is their num, one is the number, one is the size, and one is the feeding habit. So if you are playing with the dimensions of a food wave, then you are landing in trouble. Okay. So as we are lucky here that somehow the dimensions, although have changed a little bit, but it did not affect the overall dynamics of the food wave. Okay. But if it were really disruptive, if the dimension has changed to that level that it, you cannot bring back the equilibrium, then you would have found a really trophic cascade. So this is really significant. Uh, but again, I would fall back to the, the flexibility of the copy pods, which made, which made it possible uh, not to go down to the trophic cascade route. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so the next question is from uh, Nur Muhammad Nashkar. And he's asking zooplankton study along with phytoplankton is also relevant for such traits. What is your opinion? He's asking you about your opinion on this. I would say it, it is the, it is a necessary. Unfortunately, in, uh, in the coastal lab, we do not have plankton ecologists, uh, phytoplankton ecologists or the working with us. Um, we, it's, this is an absolute, I would say it's, it is quite important uh, if you want to have a full picture of the lower food wave of an estuary, then uh, it is better to have people working at, at tandem uh, on phytoplankton, zooplankton and benthos. So you can uh, see the benthic pelagic coupling and the, um, and the energy transfer from lower level to higher level. And how that the, 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 how that link is affected uh, by either stochastic changes of cyclones or floods, or by seasonal extremes, or by simple uh, variability of tides. So yes, it is very necessary uh, to uh, include phyto, uh, phytoplankton. Thank you for your suggestion. I will think of it, and rather we need somebody we uh, who can look at phytoplankton. Yes. Okay, sir. So we have the last question. Uh, the last question is from Tonmay Nundi. He is asking, is there any chance of bioinvasion of copper pods in Ganges River estuary and either due to cyclones or any other sources? Uh, why not? I would say why not? If you, uh, all of you have seen that there is a guy called Bestiolina similis which occupied the topmost position in, in the stable environment and uh, even after cyclones. So you go back to like 30 or 40 years, you asked any of the uh, coffee pot biologists or ecologists uh, in this part of the world, uh, have you heard of Bestiolina similis? They would say no. That means these species uh, were either not there, or if they were, they were, they were not in very high numbers. Definitely, they were not the first the first guy in the class. So, but 2000 onwards, or late 2000, uh, like 2005, seven onwards, uh, we could see that different literatures are pouring, uh, they're pouring in. Uh, that says the that kind of uh, says the bestiolina is one of these uh, guys which are dominant copy pod of the uh, of the community. As I said before, that our estuaries are not at all monitored. We need we don't have classical monitoring systems like. Uh, that you may find in Chipiske Bay or San Francisco Bay, or you find Long Island. So, and we have very less number of studies after cyclones. Like I could remember only one study of uh, mere two samples uh, after Cyclone Isla. 
and that is 2000, 2009. I don't see a single study on, on anything, on estuaries uh, that has been done after a cyclone before that. Does it mean the cyclones did not never happen in estuary? Never hit the estuary, never hit the Ganges before 2009. So whatever you uh, are seeing today, who knows, they may be uh, part of the bio invasion. They may not be native. They may have come through cyclones or may have come through floods or may have been a result of ballast water. So yes, the bio invasion is always a possibility. Another thing that I, I want to say in this uh, context, that if you go back in 1970s, 1980s, the kind of coffee pot community that you used to get, a lot of the large size coffee pots and uh, very few, uh, very, very few, most of them were Harvey boards, large size. And the ones who used to be dominant at that time, you don't find them, many of them here now. You go there, now most of the copy pots are small size. They are hard, uh, the dominant ones are Harvey boards. And the dominant ones, if you uh, flip up the page of 1970 and 80s, they were not there. So the community as a whole has gone through a decadal change and it is probably uh, undergoing those changes even now. But for those sort of signals to trace those sort of changes that are occurring in our histories, uh, we need them, we need to have permanent sampling sites. We need not to have, we may not need a many but we definitely need a few judgmentally used and, and uh, supported by institutions uh, so, so that these sort of questions can be answered in, in future. And, and uh, that would be gold standard for the future generations to come because estuaries are the most productive ecosystems. If you think of their economic productivity, they are the most productive ecosystems if we don't nurture them, if we don't uh, that they monitor them uh, in a regular uh, the fashion, we may be losing a lot of our economy too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so this is all the questions we have today. Um, thank you again. Uh, it was great having you here. Uh, our convener, Professor NRI Energy, conveyed her good wishes to you. And uh, with that, uh, I thank you again for answering all these questions and uh, to be with us. Uh, so now with that, we'll conclude this session. And um, thank you, Bijoy. Thank you, sir. It was great having you here. So for our viewers, um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, join us uh, in the upcoming lectures of Biology webinar series. And please like, share our Facebook um, page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and check out our website, uh, www.zoologyhub.org. And our talks will be archived in our YouTube channel and so that you can check them out later. And thank you again for joining us. Uh, take care. Bye.